This is Barry Zelma, Zelma on Insurance. I am an attorney who has retired from the practice of law and now spend my time as an insurance claims consultant, an insurance claims expert witness, an author, and producer of these videos. Today I'd like to talk about defective design and how that involves people in the business of insurance. In order to sustain a claim for defective design, a plaintiff must first establish a prima facie case. Two essential elements of a prima facie case are injury and causation. The restatement second of torts, section 402a, requires that a plaintiff to prove a product is in a defective condition and unreasonably dangerous because the determination of whether a product is unreasonably dangerous is made through a risk-benefit analysis. The plaintiffs bear the burden of proving that the risks outweigh the benefits of the design. The word defective is often used to express a legal conclusion upon which liability may be based. When so used, defective is not a test for reaching the legal conclusion, but is merely an abbreviation of the term. Defective condition, unreasonably dangerous, as used in the restatement of torts, section 402a, is in addition, however, defective in design defect cases to refer to an aspect of the product that, according to the plaintiff, causes the product to be unreasonably dangerous. A defect does not mean a mere mechanical or functional defect, but is anything that makes the product unreasonably dangerous. For example, the Colorado Supreme Court concluded that first, the open and obvious nature of risk does not necessarily bar a strict liability claim for failure to warn. Second, the plaintiffs in asserting a design defect claim must show injury, causation, and the unreasonable dangerousness of the product according to the risk benefit analysis. Third, the correct standard with which to determine the existence of defectiveness must be complete. Improper design includes, but is not limited to, the following. Failing to account for a structure's intended use. Failing to provide for sufficient nails per square foot to attach wood members. Failing to account for the existence of expansive soils under a structure. Increasing the span of framing or decreasing the size of framing members. Or failure of the designer to plan for future load and occupancy of a structure. When I was a uh, younger lawyer, about 20 or 30 years ago, when the new Lloyds of London building was opened, there are escalators that go from one level to the other. And when it was opened on its first day, insurance brokers filled the escalators with almost every step occupied. The designer said when he saw all of those people on the escalator, I didn't design for such a heavy load. Fortunately, his design was strong enough to even carry the heavy load he did not think he designed to carry. So when a structure collapses due to a load that is greater than that which the designer anticipated, then the owner, builder, and designer can all be found liable for the injuries and damages caused by the collapse. There are also weather-related defects, because all stru structures are subject to the effects of weather. Structures must be designed to withstand forces of nature, 
and if they fail to do so, builders, developers, and engineers are subject to suit for the defective structure. Structures cannot be expected, of course, to withstand all hazards imposed by nature, but they must be able to withstand those reasonably anticipated. Buildings are expected to hold up to typical risks faced by typical structures. The determination of what a typical risk or typical structure is a function for the trier of fact, the judge or jury, based on evidence presented at trial. For example, a structure built in a desert with a flat roof would be typical, but not so if built in the mountains of Colorado where heavy snowfall is expected. If the person who is injured by actions of nature, excessive snowfall, avalanches, tornadoes, hurricanes, or earthquakes, can prove that the builder or owner owed a duty to others, liability will lie in favor of the injured person or owner of the injurious property if the property was found to be the proximate cause of the injury. For example, liability may be found if a structure on the west coast of the United States where earthquakes are common did not have its structural members bolted to the foundation or in the tornado alley of the Midwest was built without a basement, or in the rainforest of western Washington state was built without drainage or roof gutters. Some people will claim that a roof is insufficient. Typical problems encountered with roof systems are leaks or the inability to withstand the forces of high winds. Leak prone roofs, or roofs that do not hold up to strong winds, can be the result of design complexity and can involve either pitched or flat roof designs. The majority of roofing problems are a direct result of improper specifications of building materials, which can result in water penetration into the structure, intrusion, or other problems. Poor drainage design and the inadequacy of structural members can result in cracks and deterioration of roofing components and materials. A roof that has not been built with consideration to the types of windstorms that can occur in the location, which depends on that geographic location of the structure, can lead to a roof failure and is therefore considered a defect. At the time of construction, the following types of windstorms that come to the location where the structure is built must be considered and include things like 1. Hurricanes, 2. Gales, 3. Tornadoes, 4. Santa Ana winds, or just 5. Just high winds. Roof failures can range from shingles blowing off a roof during high winds to the total loss of a roof structure in a tornado. In one case, a roof collapsed from the weight of snow and the landlord was found to have no obligation to clear snow from the roof. A roof failure can bar recovery in the following cases. 1. When the economic loss doctrine can be applied to prevent liability to a builder. 2. When the only damage caused by the collapse due to the weight of snow was the failed product. 3. When the problem arises after the expiration of a statute of limitations or a statute of repose. Or 4. When the owner released the builder from liability with a valid contract supported by sufficient evidence and sufficient consideration. A defective structure can be destroyed in one single weather event or can slowly deteriorate over a period of time. In certain areas, special consideration should be given to the kinds of weather that a structure will endure. For example, 
A home built on the San Andreas fault line should be built with the consideration to earth movement. A b dwelling built with masonry that is not reinforced may not be considered defective if built at a seismically stable area like Minnesota or North Dakota, but it is considered defective if built along the seismically active areas of the west coast of the U.S., where earthquake and volcanic action are frequent. Similarly, Although building a roof designed to withstand a 60 mile per hour gale is appropriate in low wind areas, the same roof may be considered defective if built to the standard of the Gulf Coast or the southern east coast of the U.S., where hurricanes seem to strike annually. Damage caused by construction defects of overspanned and undersized joists combined with earthquake vibrations in California, have resulted in many effective lawsuits against builders, designers, and insurers. Structures need to be built to withstand the following types of earth movement or weather conditions, depending on the geographic region of the structure and the risks faced by the structure. Earthquakes, volcanic activity, sinkholes, settlements, subsidence, hurricanes, tornadoes, cyclones, wave wash, or high tides. Various problems can occur when consideration is not given to the weather or seismic phenomena discussed earlier. Homes that wash away in high tides on the Gulf Coast of the United States or the East Coast of Florida when inevitable hurricanes blow through, may be defective if not designed to withstand the types of winds typical to the area. Consider, for example, the Minnesota statute that provides, quote, major construction defect means actual damage to the load-bearing portion of the dwelling or the home improvement including damage due to subsidence, expansion, or lateral movement of the soil which affects the load-bearing function and which vitally affects or is imminently likely to vital, vitally affect use of the dwelling or the home improvement for residential purposes. Major construction defect does not include damage due to movement of the soil caused by flood, earthquake, or other natural disaster. It's a case called Vlahos v. R&I, a 2004 decision of the Minnesota Supreme Court, where the Minnesota Supreme Court held that a summary judgment was inappropriate against the homeowner and that the statute of limitations did not run and there was a major construction defect. This video was adapted from my book, Construction Defect and Insurance, Volume 2, which is available as both a Kindle book and a paperback from Amazon.com, with details available about the entire eight-volume set of Construction Defect and Insurance, by clicking on the insurance claim library, my website, zalma.com. If you found this video to be interesting or useful to you in your profession, please refer it to your colleagues. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and to my blog so that you can receive information about future blog posts and future videos. Thank you for your attention.